Our planet's surface is more than 70% water. What it creates, what it destroys, what happens on it and in it is all part of our world. As I explore the wild water of planet Earth, I could lose my lunch. Or a whole lot more. Man has had many reasons to fear the water, not just for its waves and power, but also for what lies beneath. No animal is more feared than the one I'm going to look for near Guadalupe Island, 150 kilometers off the Baja Peninsula in the Pacific Ocean. Each year, about five people are killed by sharks, yet 38 million sharks are killed by people, often for nothing more than a bowl of shark fin soup. What's the state of this shark population? What's the state of the oceans? I'm heading south to try and find some answers. Tiny Guadalupe Island is one of the best spots in the world to get close to the ocean's most feared inhabitant. This is where the journey really begins, here at H&M Landing in San Diego. The next five days are gonna be spent on the boat, in the water, and in the shark cage, surrounded by some of the biggest and baddest great white sharks in the world. This is home for the next week, an 85-foot high-tech shark observation vessel. As we head for open ocean, our captain fills me in on what kind of conditions to expect. So we're headed offshore to Guadalupe Island, and here we have about a one to two foot wind swell. Yeah. It's uh, not too choppy, uh, but as we get further offshore, the seas will build to four to six feet. Right. Uh, the winds are supposed to be 10 to 15 knots, uh, and there we'll definitely notice a difference. Much more rock and roll uh, with a seven to nine foot swell. So uh, I'll be up here uh, strapped in, hanging on, and uh, making sure that we bring the boat back in one piece. Great. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be green, I just know it. <laughs> it's a long 24-hour voyage to the remote island, but as we approach it, I can see that it's the perfect spot for me. You can actually tell the Guadalupe used to be an old ancient volcano. There's layer upon layer of pyroclastic flows that have built up over thousands and thousands of years. You can see where they've broken off into the sea. It's a really impressive island. And as shark experts have discovered, a popular spot for one of the sea's most impressive creatures. Dive master Doc Ains runs this trip to Guadalupe. These great white sharks have always been known on the west coast of the U.S., primarily in northern and central California. Everybody had originally thought that white sharks were primarily coastal sharks. Well, the data from the satellite tags is now telling us that these animals migrate over tremendous distances. We believe that what the white sharks are doing here at Guadalupe is using the island as a fueling stop in perhaps the midpoint of the migration out towards the central Pacific. Primarily our focus here is underwater photography. This is probably the best place, at least right now, for getting underwater images of these animals. So we try and be as careful as possible with the animals. Shark will come in this way, they'll pull it. Shark will come in this way, they'll pull it. Bob Gladden is the ship's photography expert and has spent many hours underwater with the Great Whites. They have a personality to start with. You start to see things with them, facial expressions, different behaviors and stuff with them, uh, along with 
just how they react. Nice. Right up to the camera. They react differently than what we usually think. Unlike in the movies where they're always moving at a fast pace, most of the time they're moving very slow and very graceful in their movements, yet there are times when they can abruptly uh, turn on the speed and do things. The crew is busy getting ready for the first dive, but I have to take it easy for a while. Even though it's beautiful, bright sunshine, the swells here are still pretty heavy, and uh, there's been a few times here on this trip where I've been rather ill from the rocking of this boat. And uh, I guess it's another part of the water that uh, can certainly take you out. If you're prone to seasickness, this next job is definitely not for you. Recycle, recycle. Once San Diego's tuna fishermen are finished filleting the fish for human consumption, they give the remains to Doc Ains to return to the sea. Nothing but the finest for my sharkies. If you want great whites to visit you, this is the best invitation. This stuff is like a fish magnet. Mmm, mmm, soup's on. I have to get my mind off my stomach now. It's time to go diving. I'm getting ready for my first dive with giant great white sharks. Finally, the cages go in. The crew is like a well-oiled machine. cages are big and heavy, and the boat is constantly pitching, but they get them in and secure. And I'm next. Okay, who's ready? Next diver. Another one. All right, Doc. All right. You know what to do. Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, yeah. Visibility here is incredible. The pole cam will keep an eye on us as we dive. I settle into the cage and the crew sets the bait. It's definitely working on these guys. Now I just have to wait for the really big fish. When you're a two-ton eating machine, you show up for dinner when you're darn good and ready. Before I know it, my dive time is up for the day. No, no sharks yet. Just lots of mackerel. And I got stung in the face by a jellyfish. Maybe tomorrow, we'll see the great whites. As the first dive day winds down, we rest and check out the day's footage and hope for success tomorrow. All right, folks, this is where we're off here. Now's the time to ensure all your gear is secure, low and tight.
Well, there's already been a few sharks spotted this morning. And if we're lucky, we'll stick around all day. If we're really lucky, we'll get to see a big one that's maybe 12 or 14 feet long. If we're really lucky. And today is our lucky day. White shark! White shark! Yes, right there! Run! Go directly in the rotation! Rupe! Rupe! A huge great white is spotted, and in seconds, I'm in the water. Adrenaline is pumping as I check out my surroundings. From out of nowhere, the biggest shark I've ever seen. This thing is the size of a tank. It's all I can do to hang on to my camera as it passes inches by me and tears into the tuna heads. And then from below, another one, just as big. concern because I'm sort of hanging outside the cage <laughs> which is a bit of a no-no and filming this one shark and I turn around another one and they're appearing out of nowhere it's like blue 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 shark turn around another shark wow oh man that was a great dive awesome <laughs> nice big sharks too not these little wimpy girly sharks. We're talking big sharks. The girl. <laughs> Not the girls that are the wimpy sharks. <laughs> My next adventure, scary caves and huge waves. corner of northeastern Ontario, this powerful river combined with natural chemicals and time to secretly carve out an amazing underground cave system. The caves were discovered in 1952 by Tom Woodward, a local who conquered his fear of the unknown to make a remarkable discovery. I've come here to retrace Tom's adventure. Chris Hinsberger met Woodward when he was a boy and has been protecting the caves ever since. We descend more than 15 meters, where Chris explains how the caves were formed. What, what exactly is the process of how this particular cave formed? This cave, George, is a solution cave. Everywhere you look at these stone walls, you're seeing the subtle dissolving action of water over thousands of years. The water from the Bonnechere River here is actually what carved the Bonnechere Caves. It was discovered by Tom Woodward, and he actually took a dinghy, brought it into the cave, and what fought the current, very similar to what this is. And I'm going to try recreating that by fighting this current here in the river itself. Looks pretty strong. I just got to rig up some ropes across the river for safety. The current here is pretty strong, so if I fall in, I could easily go down and head right over the waterfall. I start rigging ropes which doesn't go quite according to plan. All right, I've got a rope rigged across the river, and now I'm gonna run this one downstream in the center. And this will simulate the uh, effect of the current. The current from this river is surprisingly powerful and threatens to drag me down to the larger rapids downstream. Oh. Luckily, I catch an eddy and manage to swim out. Holy 
crap. That's strong. Man, the current just swept my feet out from under me. You think it's, uh, you know, you think you can stand up in that kind of thing, but whew, I'm glad I had that safety line. I could actually hold on to it and slow my descent down the river, downstream, but I had a bit of, bit of a scare there. Time to get on with the experiment. Now, I'm gonna be doing this in the river, but imagine Tom Woodward actually inside the cave trying to pull himself through a very similar current here. So this will be a little bit easier than what he had to do. And this is not gonna be easy. I have to keep my weight at the front of the boat. Apparently the water level in the cave and the speed of the water would have been comparable to what we have here. One main difference though, in the cave, there would have been very sharp rock right beside Tom's head on either side. When Tom came through these passages, there would have been a ton of water rushing through here. There would have been almost complete darkness. And these sharp edges here, they're like arrowheads sticking out the side of the rocks that were formed by the water rushing through here. And in his boat, he would have been in a lot of danger of actually slashing the side of the boat. And of course, he hit his head, dropped his flashlight, would have had no light whatsoever. And then he would have had no choice but to use his rope pulling against the current and try and get out of here without getting killed. This sinkhole here is the actual natural cave entrance that Tom used to first enter the cave. He would have dragged his boat down in the ice and snow of the winter, lugged it down this slope, and actually dumped it into the water and made his first exploration into the cave. I'll return to the caves in the winter to finish my exploration. In the meantime, I'm off to explore another little river. At over a million gallons per second, Niagara Falls is the most famous and impressive display of water power on Earth. One of the most powerful forces of nature occurs when you combine water with gravity. This is the Niagara River, and these rapids here are considered class six. That means they're extremely dangerous and virtually impassable to all boats, kayaks, and rafts. Unless, of course, you have one of these. Time to get on the jet boat. All I need now is my sexy outfit. Let's get wet. Horsepower jet boats are the only thing that can navigate this wild water. I've returned to northeastern Ontario in the winter to continue Tom's cave adventure. Taking a boat into an unexplored cave is crazy enough even in the best of conditions, but he did it in the dead of winter like it is now. So of course, that's how I have to do it. The frozen conditions make it tough to get into the cave's original entry point. Well, this is it for the land portion of this exploration. From here on in, nothing but water. 
Besides the raging current, the cave's original explorer had one more thing to worry about. When Tom was here exploring it, he did it in complete darkness. Tom actually dropped his one and only flashlight. He never did find it. Because of that, he was trapped, he was stuck, not knowing when he was gonna bump his head or when he was gonna see the light of day ever again. Fighting the powerful current and exploring the dark cave full of nothing but bats and freezing water, I'm getting a good idea of what Tom Woodward experienced on his wild water adventure. These ancient caves, the mighty Niagara, and the oceans that are home to these magnificent creatures prove the influence that water has on the natural world. Sharks have been in the fossil records as far back as 400 million years. And quite a few of them have not changed all that much in those eons. Sharks were around before the dinosaurs. They were even around before trees. Most people come down here with a certain amount of fear and they leave with a totally different vision of what sharks are. And it usually leaves a lasting impression that sticks with them the rest of their lives. These creatures have been adapting to our changing planet for millions of years. And although Guadalupe Island appears to have a healthy shark population, these animals are being depleted worldwide at an alarming rate. Like sharks, we are dependent on the well-being of the world's water ecosystems. But only we have the power to destroy or preserve our blue planet. <laughs>